All right, time for a little more modern physics, part two here. If you haven't watched part one, I'd recommend going back and doing that first. Um, part one deals with the electron cloud, um, some physics of, what, of uh, what the electrons are doing. Now we go down into the nucleus here. All right, and we'll start here with a very, very tiny chemistry review. All right. And just, just on symbols a little bit here. Okay, so what do these things mean? This is the element symbol. All right, periodic table. And this is the number of protons. This here is the mass number. Okay, and the mass number is your protons plus your neutrons. All right, total number of nucleons, we might say. All right, so that's going to help us get um, into nuclear reactions. And we're going to talk about three types of nuclear decay here. And those would be alpha, beta, and gamma. Once we talk about alpha, beta, and gamma decay, we are going to get into E equals delta mc squared. All right, maybe the most famous of all physics equations. Okay, so we'll start with alpha decay. Alpha decay is when the nucleus emits an alpha particle. Okay, and an alpha particle is a helium nucleus. It's got a symbol. And it looks like that. And the helium nucleus has a mass number of four and an atomic number of two. So protons, I don't know if I said this, we'll put this here too, atomic number. All right, and the difference between an alpha particle and actual helium if we did this, this has its electron cloud, okay? Its two electrons are present if we write this. This does not have the two electrons. So it's actually got a positive two charge because it's, it's unbalanced by two. Okay, so let's, let's look at this. Really big elements undergo nuclear decay. Um, at least alpha decay usually is, is bigger elements. So let's say we got U238 and it's gonna undergo alpha decay. What element is created? So what we're gonna do here as we go through these, we're gonna do three examples of nuclear reactions. So in chemistry, you might have done some chemical reactions, but you probably didn't do any nuclear reactions yet. So Here's what we do. We put what we start with on the left side. We call that the products. And we've got 238 and 92. Okay? So what that means is uranium, and I got this, this off the periodic table, uranium has 92 protons. All right? And that's what makes it uranium, by the way. If it goes up or down even one proton, it is no longer uranium. It is a different element, okay? Um, and then the 238 would be the protons plus the neutrons, okay? Now, in AP Physics 2, you are not gonna have to use the periodic table, so this information would be given to you. You don't have a periodic table during the test. It's not anywhere on your constants page. There's some information, like the mass of one proton and one neutron, that is on there. Okay, and we will use some of this stuff right here, mass of an electrons on there, but you do not have to memorize anything off the periodic table, know any element symbols. Um, you just have to know what these numbers mean and um, some, some basic things about how they are conserved as we go through this. Okay, so products and then an arrow indicates that a reaction happened. Okay, so we wanna know what element is created 
And yes, we would have to have a periodic table for this um, if in, you know, to figure out the symbol and all of that. And that's okay for our examples here. I'll just, I'll just tell them to you. But just know that you wouldn't have to know that on the, on the exam. Okay, so I'm gonna leave a big space here and I'm gonna put over here that an alpha particle is gonna come off and we're gonna just assume it's one alpha particle for this decay. And here's the deal. Our mass, our total number of mass, our nucleons has to be conserved. Okay, so we had 238, four went to the alpha particle, so pretty simple. What's left over is 234, but that is not gonna tell us what element is created. Okay, because there are things called isotopes. Isotopes, for example, I could have uranium-237, which would still be 92, but it would be 237 for the mass number. So it'd be, it'd be down a neutron. Okay, anyway, back to this. Um, we had 92. We lost two to the alpha particle, so we have 90 here. And if you look up the element with 90 protons, that's gonna be thorium. Okay, so we'll put that symbol, and that's the new element that's created. Okay, now the big thing you have to know for these types of problems is, again, the mass number is conserved, okay? And then in this example with our alpha particle, okay, we had 92. Check this out, we've got 92 down here still for our protons, okay? All right, now let's look at beta particles. <clears throat> beta particles are a little bit more complicated because we can have beta positive and beta negative decay. Okay, so definition, the nucleus emits either a positron or an electron. Okay, so we use this symbol, beta positive, beta negative, and those you do kind of need to know. You need to know what those symbols mean. Um, mass stays the same. Okay, so the mass, the mass of our after the decay is gonna stay the same. All right, so the positron, when that happens, we have beta positive decay, and so we'll, we'll divide this up into two parts. So over here, let's do B positive, beta negative. All right, and we'll just do an example for each. So let's say we have some neon. Neon does undergo an isotope of neon does undergo beta positive decay. So neon 19 has got 19 nucleons and 10 of those must be protons or it would not be neon. Okay, and then over here, I'm gonna put E positive. Okay, that is another way to indicate a beta particle, a positive. Um, a positron. So where did that come from is the, is the key thing we need to know here. And here's what's happening. The proton, one of the protons in the nucleus is actually giving up its charge and turning into a neutron. Okay, so the protons, it's like it's giving away its positive charge, but it's not giving away a whole proton. Okay, so this is just the same mass as an electron. It's called a positron, all right? So I'll put an arrow there, that's positron. Okay, so if a proton is going away, then I have to change this 10 down to a nine, all right? Now, the mass is going to stay the same. So up here, Whoops, this is still gonna be 19, not 10. Okay, that's gonna be 19. And now, if we looked on the periodic table, we have fluorine instead. 
Okay, so that's an example of beta positive decay. Okay, beta negative. Let's take a look at this one. Good example is carbon 14. Okay, carbon's got six protons. And what's going to happen is we are going to give up a, an electron. Okay, but it is not an electron from the electron cloud. Okay, here's what's happening. The electron is still coming from the nucleus, which is completely weird because where are there negative charges in the nucleus? Okay, well, a neutron is actually a proton fused with an electron. Okay, so if that neutron gives up the electron, that neutron becomes a proton. So what happens is instead of having an atomic number of six, we actually go up an atomic number instead of going down. So we now have seven, which is nitrogen, and the mass number is gonna stay the same. Okay, and we're gonna get this electron flying off. Okay, so that's big beta negative decay. And there's also a side note, a neutrino also comes off, all right, which is tiny, tiny mass and no charge. So there's some other little details that go along with these. We are barely scratching the surface of nuclear reactions as we go through. Um, but we are learning the basic rules, which is kind of a cool start. Gamma decay, okay, you've taught, we've talked about gamma radiation when we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum, and it is high, high energy photons, okay? very high energy photons. And they're coming from the nucleus. No charge, no mass associated with these. Okay, but here's what's happening. Let's say we got U-238 again. Okay, and sometimes you'll see a star next to the element. Okay, and what, what's happened here is the nucleus is charged up to an energy level, okay? The nucleus is, has been hit by something or bombarded by something, and it is at a higher energy level itself. So we talked about how when we did the electrons, um, when we did the uh, energy levels for electrons, we talked about how they can go up and down energy states, okay? Well, nuclei can do the same thing. So when this is at a high energy level and it has to release that energy, it can release gamma radiation. Okay, so we just copy down uranium again. And we put the sign for gamma radiation, which looks like that. Okay, and um, the photon carries a bunch of energy and momentum. Okay, and we talked about that, um, de, Broglie, um, de Broglie wavelengths and all of that in the last uh, segment. So the nucleus is going to recoil and this energy is gonna be given off. Those three are our three types of radiation that we need to know about. Okay, and we'll encounter some other details with that when we do some multiple choice. This mo does mostly show up in multiple choice questions and we'll talk about how to deal with those situations as we go through them. In all three of these reactions energy is also released. So off to the to the right of these we could also put plus energy, plus energy, plus energy. Okay now where does that energy comes come from? E equals delta mc squared. Okay, now remember back in physics one where your teacher said, hey, F does not equal MA. Okay, F net equals MA. All right, and it's not just a picky little detail. Um, we can't just take any force and say, oh, set it equal to MA. We have to have the net force. Okay, here, E does not equal MC squared. E equals delta MC squared. Okay, so here's what it means. In any of these reactions, take the mass that seems to be missing in kilograms, 
and multiply by c squared to figure out how many joules of energy were released. Okay, now mass that seems to be missing. What the heck does that mean? Here's the deal. Mass before decay is slightly greater than after the decay. And this mass goes into energy. Okay, now why? That gets into binding energy and where Einstein came up with all of this and different things that we're not gonna get into in this video. Um, your teacher probably went into a lot more detail when you, when you learn this in class, um, but we're not gonna get into it in the review session here. Okay, so the mass that seems to be missing, it's pretty easy, uh, the problems we have to do with this. We just need to be able to look at the reactants and how much they weigh, look at the products and how much they weigh, and figure out the difference okay so we'll do an example here and you probably wouldn't be asked to do this mathematical of an example on a physics 2 test but I think if we can do this it'll help us understand what's going on at a basic level so we can do the harder more conceptual questions okay so this is actually a fusion reaction and here we've got a bunch of little um, deuteriums, okay? And deuteriums are hydrogens, but check it out. They've got a neutron, okay? So usually hydrogen is just a proton and an electron, but these have actually got a neutron as well. And so what happens is these fuse together and we get helium and we get a hydrogen and we get a neutron. Okay, so for nuclear reactions to give energy, here's what has to always be true, whether it is fusion or fission. Um, this must be heavier. This must be lighter. And if that is not true, we will not get, a, get energy from the nuclear reaction. Okay, it would take energy, as a matter of fact. Determine the mass defect of a single reaction given the following info. Okay, so really this is an exercise in adding. Okay, how easy is that? Let's look at the reactants first. Okay, so our reactants, we just need to add them together. We've got three deuteriums and we're going to use um, AMU to add these up for now so we've got three 2.014 ones and if you multiply that you are going to get 6.0423 atomic mass units all right now you notice on this chart I gave you the masses in kilograms of the different subatomic particles. Okay, over here they're in atomic mass units, or U is, is what we write after. Okay, so we can be working in either. Okay, now let's look at the products. And we will simply add all of those up. For the products, we've got a helium, so that is 4.0026, plus a hydrogen, 1.0078, plus a neutron, 1.0087. And if we add those up, we get 6.0191, okay? And you can see that the products are in fact lighter than the reactants. Okay, so when this happened, mass was actually lost. All right, kind of a weird concept. That mass actually got converted into energy. Okay, so let's find the delta M. Delta M is going to be the heavier one minus the lighter one. And we get 0 0.0232. Okay. 
All right, now we're gonna figure out the energy in joules released during the fusion reaction. Okay, so we're gonna use this. All right, now when we use this, just like any time we're using mass, it's gotta be in kilograms, okay? And then that's just the speed of light. So we need to do a conversion real quick. So we'll take our 0 0.0232 AMU and we'll convert it to kilograms. So we want to say how many kilograms are in that many atomic mass units. So this is the unit we want to cancel. We'll put it diagonal. This is the unit we want to go to. And if we look this up on our constants page, one AMU is 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. Okay, so where did I get that? Um, well, I have it memorized, so where is it on here? Uh, right there. All right. Okay, so if we punch that into our calculator, 3.85 times 10 to the negative 29th kilograms. Okay, so let's plug it into this equation. Our delta M is the number we just got. and c squared. We will get 3.47 times 10 to the negative 12 joules. Okay? Doesn't look like very much energy, and it's not. Okay? That's a tiny amount of joules. We couldn't really do anything with that. But we also have to remember that that is for just one fusion reaction, okay? And we usually don't just have one. So multiplied many, many times, this gives lots of energy, okay? This is what the sun does right here. Okay, next we are going to go on and do some multiple choice. So we will do these two together right here and then I'll have you do the back on your own. These first two multiple choice I picked because they're about half-life. Half-life is a brand new thing on the physics two test and I actually have not seen one actual question on it yet but since it's a new thing and teachers are kinda of getting used to having it around let's go over it with these two multiple choice questions we have to know how to deal with it on graphs and we have to know how to kind of be able to do a little bit of a calculation. So let's look at this first. The graph shows the decay of a sample of carbon-14 initially at n sub zero atoms. Which of the lettered points on the time axis could represent the half-life? Okay. These are very easy questions. Let's look at this. So we have n sub zero. Down here would be when there are none of them left. They are decaying and, and growing fewer and fewer as time goes by. Okay, now this right here is n sub zero over two, the point where there are only half of them left. So if I go over here and then I go down, that is the half-life. So the answer is A. All right, very, very easy. Okay, now this question is maybe a little bit more complicated than what I think they are going to ask us. Um, but if you know a little bit more than what you're going to be tested on, that is always a good thing, right? So let's do this. It's kind of a longer example, and I'll do some, I'll teach you guys some stuff as we go through this one. Um, here's the deal. We're going we're gonna to do this using a table. We've got two samples of radioactive material. We've got sample A, 
and it's got a mass of 0.28 and a half-life of 10 days. Sample B, okay, we've got its mass and its half-life. Okay, and then it asks us during which of the following time periods will the two samples pass the moment where they have the same amount of material left? Okay, so the difficult thing is we have to deal with two materials at the same time. So sample A, we'll put a column. Sample B, put a column for that, and we're just going to compare what is happening to these two as time goes by. So over here, I'm going to add a time column. If you want to do this on a sheet of notebook paper so you can study from it, this is a really good example here. Okay. Now, one of them counts half-lives by 10, and one of them counts half-lives by 15. So I'm going to go by multiples of 5 on my time chart here. 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and so on. And I'm going to go all the way out to time equals 50 days. Okay, so what the heck is a half-life anyway? Well, here's what it means. Do not make it harder than it is. It's very, very simple. It's the time for half of it to go away. Okay, so let's look at sample A only. A is the 0.28 with the 10 days. Okay, so at time equals zero, we have 0.28 grams. Okay, then at 10 days, we are going to have not 0.28 anymore, but 0.14. Okay, let's jump another half-life. Now I'm using this, I've got 0.07. Let's jump another half-life, I've got 0 0.035. At 40, I'm gonna have 0 0.0175. Okay, and then from 40 to 50, 0 0.0175 divided by two, 0.00875. Okay, and those are all in grams. So this is showing how much is left as we go up in time. Okay, sample B. Let's check that one out. Sample B has got 0 0.08 to start with. So we've got less of it, but it um its half-life is longer, it sticks around longer. So it's got a half-life this time of 15 days. So as I go through the chart here, um, I'm gonna count by 15s. So I've got 0.04 at 15 days. Let's go another half-life up to 30, and I've got 0 0.02, okay? So here, I've still got more of sample A than I do of sample B, okay? Let's go to 45 days. I've got 0 0.01 right here, okay? And answer D right here says more than 40 days, okay? So let's check out what's happening at 40 days, okay? Because we can see somewhere in here it's gonna pass, but there's a way for us to check and know at 40 days did these things pass each other, okay? So here's the equation, and I don't think you're going to be expected to actually use this equation on the AP Physics 2 test, but it might come in handy. Okay, A equals AO times one half, and that is raised to the power of T over H. Okay, now it looks kind of complicated, but it's very, very easy to use. Here's what it means. This is how much you have left at a certain time. This is how much you start with. Okay, this half is because it's a half life. This is the time you want to know about. Okay, now this equation, these times we want to know about are multiples of the half-life, so they're very easy to deal with. 
Okay, but what if we want to know for sample B at a time that's not a multiple of its half-life? Okay, or some weird day. What if we wanted to know what was going on on day 31.5 for sample B? Or even throw hours in there or something like that. That's when this equation becomes helpful. So that's the time we want to know about, time gone by. And this is little h is the actual half-life. Okay, so let's do an example for sample B. Okay, how many we have left is going to be how much we start with, which is 0.08, all right, times a half, and that's a constant, that's what we always have there, raised to the power of t over h. Okay, so the time we would like to know about for sample B is 40 days. And by the way, it doesn't matter what unit you are in, as long as your time and your half-life are in the same unit. And then H, the actual half-life for this one is, we've been counting by 15s. Okay, so let's punch that into our calculators. All right, you can try it on yours, 0 0.08 times 0.5 raised to the power of parentheses 40 divided by 15. Okay, so I'm going to punch it in like that. I'm going to get 0 0.01259. So right here, 0 0.01259. Okay, so you can see at 40 days, this this one is still not less than this one. So they haven't passed yet. So the answer is going to be D, more than 40 days. Okay, and I think even though I haven't seen them ask us a half-life um, question, I think you're going to be able to reason through them just like this using charts rather than having to use this equation. But if you kind of know a little bit more than the, uh, that's on the test, that's a good good tool to have in your back pocket right here. So hopefully that helps you out with half-life and as we get tested on it more we will we will know no more example questions to give you. Alright here's what I want you to do. I would like you to pause and work the rest of the multiple choice questions on the next um, next two pages okay work the next set of multiple choice before we go over these little education on the 90s let's see what you got name that 90s song Ah, a personal favorite, amazing song, just takes me back. All right, let's see how these went. Um, two main things on this, conservation of charge and conservation of nucleon number. Okay, those two things must be true in these. So let's, let's go through each one and kind of learn more about that. Okay, so proton collides with this nitrogen, produces that, and one other particle. What is that particle? Name that particle. So we start out with a proton. So I'm going to go like that. It's got a charge of one. It's got a mass of one. And it's going to collide with something that has got this configuration. And that's given to us. Notice we don't have to use the periodic table. Then we're going to get this. We're going to get an 11,6 carbon. If you don't write this out, good luck getting this correct. You might be a lot smarter than me and be able to do it, but very difficult if you don't write these out. Okay, so first of all, our number of um, nucleons have to be conserved. So here I've got 15. Here I've got 11. So I need something with four more nucleon. Okay, protons plus neutrons. Here I've got eight positives. Okay, so that means I have to have something with two more positives. 
So I've got a four and a two, that looks suspiciously like an alpha particle. Okay, so answer is D. Okay, next one. Um, do you know what tritium is? Thing is, you do not have to to get this right. Okay, it's actually an isotope of hydrogen, um, but you don't really need to know that. You could call it capital T when you're doing the equation here. This is a beta decay problem. So we've got um, three neutrons and a proton, two neutrons and a proton. So that means that our mass number is three, and you might have figured out since it just has one proton that, hey, it's hydrogen. Okay, don't let that throw you off. Okay, then it's gonna undergo beta decay. So on this side, we know we are gonna get an electron, all right? And that an electron, we could even put down here that it is minus one charge, okay? And it's got zero mass as far as nucleon numbers go. Okay, then what are we gonna get on this side? Okay, how did we get that? We have to remember that in beta negative decay, we've got a neutron that is turning into a proton. It's giving up, remember a neutron is a proton and an electron fused. So it's giving up that electron. And so down here, we are now gonna have two protons. And the nucleon number is conserved. So we had three, we still have three. All right, and you notice here that two minus a one is, is a one. So our charge is conserved and that is gonna be also an isotope of helium, okay? Here it was an alpha particle, here it's actual helium. So the answer is A. Okay, next one. We, this time we're given the equation we want to know the total number of free neutrons in the product. So how many neutrons must be here for this to be true? Okay, so the nucleon number up here to start with is 236. So on this side, I also have to have 236. So let's get out the calculator. 138 plus 95. 233, so I've got 233 right here. So that means I've gotta have three more nucleon right there to make this statement true. So answer is B. Which of the following statements is always true for a neutron-induced neutron fission reaction? Okay, well let's look at this. The end products always include barium and krypton. Is that true? Up here it was, okay, for this one. All right, but does it always have to have that? Absolutely not. Lots of different types of um, daughter elements can come out of this, as they're called. The rest mass of the end products is less than what we started with. That is true, for sure. Okay, and the reason why is because we get this released energy. So the rest mass, or the mass, or the mass defect, okay? Um, the mass defect is not the mass of this. The mass defect is the difference between this and this. All right, but this has to be less for us to get this released energy. Okay, um, then the total number of nucleons in the end is less than that of what we started with? Absolutely not. Nucleons must be conserved. So that is definitely an obvious wrong one. The answer is A. Okay, a couple more examples here. Here are the answers A. All right, and you're just doing what we did up there, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Um, it does come out to 9136 if you add those and that would be Krypton. Okay, here a uh, negative beta particle and gamma ray are emitted. Which of the following is the resulting nucleus? 214, 82, 
lead. And on this side, we know that we're going to get a beta negative or an electron. And that's got a negative one charge and zero nucleons. And we're also going to get a gamma particle. Okay, so here's the deal. This is not going to affect either of these numbers. It's not going to affect charge because it's simply a photon. And it's not going to affect mass because it doesn't have any mass. Okay? So here, we, this, is, this is beta decay again. So a neutron is turning into a protron. proton. So if that is true, we know we're going to have 83. Okay, so that eliminates these three. So it's either C or D. Since the mass is not affected, we know that the answer is D. All right, and so we would have on here to complete the reaction, 214, 83. Okay, there you go. All right, next side. Okay, I threw this one on there because um, these units right here, MeV per C, per C squared, what a weird unit. Okay, what does that mean? Let's check it out. Um, we have E equals MC squared. And if we look at this, this unit is an energy over C squared. So if I rearrange this to make energy over C squared, I get delta M is equal to an energy over C squared. So here they're putting MeV, which does not look anything like an energy, but it means millions of electron volts. Okay, and we know electron volts are energy. And then over C squared, this is a unit of mass. Okay, so be aware of that. that. That shows up from time to time. Okay, now we don't need to know anything about uh, lambda particles or any of that to get these answers right. Okay, all we need to know is here we got products. Oh, sorry, reactants. Okay, and here we got products. Trying to write fast. <laughs> okay, so we need to find the mass defect to find the energy released. So if we're gonna find the, ma the mass defect here, um, we're simply going to take the this one and then we're going to subtract these right here and if you do that you simply get this okay that's going to be the energy released okay number two these things are moving and then they break apart. The answer is C. You know that from conservation of momentum last year that if an internal force, okay, let's say we have two blocks sliding together and then a spring pops them apart, okay, and they keep moving, um, the momentum's gonna be the same direction and there's no external force, it is an internal force. Okay, so that really goes back to physics one, conservation of momentum. This one, I love this because it throws magnetism in, my favorite. Okay, so we've got a field right here. And we've simply got negative and positive particles being fired into the field. Okay, so you need to use your hand rule to figure this one out. So draw it, um, put a velocity vector on there. You need to deal with the force, the B field, and the current. Okay, and remember current is the flow of positive charge. So the answer is D once you do your hand rule. Keep doing that until you get it right. Okay, difficult problem right here. 
Try it out, try it out with a buddy. Your teacher may or may not require it. It just depends. And maybe you'll go over it in class. Your teacher does have the key. All right, hope you had a great time studying modern physics to the nucleus.